morning. This is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community. And The Pepper Master, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season four and episode number 447 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. Yay! Today, recording day is Wednesday, August 14th, 2024, and it looks like it's going to be a nice day here at the Beaver Lodge. Uh, I've got a little bit of a morning glow coming out through the window here. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, hey, Mr. Beaver, hey, and uh, with me, as you can see, drinking from a very Canadian cup is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly, live from New Brunswick. You're just all over the place this summer, Mr. Grizzly. Yeah, getting the miles in for sure. (laughs) Goes to our founding sponsors, the Pepper Master, the Miss V Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and CanadianTarot.com. And for those of you on the chat who are guessing, hair up today. (laughs) Uh, All right, Mr. Grizzly, um, you've been, uh, as uh, the title says, on the road again. Yes. You're in your Brunswick <clears throat> on the road again. So how's your mental health today? Pretty good, actually. I uh, flew in yesterday. Uh, of course, typical travel things being what they are these days. I get to the airport. And I'm like, well, I've got two hours before my flight. I thought, you know, I always try and get even a domestic two hours before because you know what security can be like. It can be a, a nightmare. Sometimes. It yep. wasn't. <laughs> Literally, there were three people. You just sailed on through. Oh, yeah. There were three people in front of me yesterday, and I sailed right on through. Like, it was nobody's. I, I, they went into one line. I went into one. Well, I went in by myself. So it was like, get right through. The longest part was, and this happened to me in Calgary, too. My hat popped out of the tray because they make you put your hat on for x-ray. I'm wearing a straw, Panama straw hat. Come on. But what do you, okay, fine. Put it on the x-ray. The flaps, when it comes out of the x-ray, knock it off the tray and it gets stuck in there. So I had to get somebody to get it for me. That took more time than anything else, which I think is funny. Uh, but then it was like, I'm like, uh, they're like, yeah, you're good. I'm like, oh, okay. So I just sailed on and went down. I'm like, well, I got two hours before my flight. It took me from the time I got out of my Uber and walked to security to uh, pass the security checkpoint about three minutes, which so- that's never happened before. Mr. Chris, are you saying that Canada is not broken? I'm saying Canada is not broken at all. <gasps> <laughs> that will be a shock to the politician, fun for God. Yes, you think? A little bit, maybe. So, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> sailed right on through and just went down. I'm like, well, I guess I'll have a pint because it's, it's 1210. What else am I going to do? And then I, because my I, we were supposed to board at 130, then I get a notification boarding at 2. I'm like, oh, okay, well. I guess I'll have another pint and I'll have a bite to eat. And so I go down there at, at uh, 10 to 2 because I didn't feel like waiting forever. My phone keeps going to sleep for some bloody reason right now. I don't know why. Got to keep touching the screen. Anyway, right. it's annoying. So I go down there and I'm like, okay, we're not ready to board yet. Well, 
were supposed to board at at 1:55 p.m. We boarded at 2:35 p.m. for a scheduled 2:35 takeoff. Well, mm. we didn't take off until three, but we landed. Mm. We landed on time with the 30 minute augmentation from earlier. So even though we boarded like an okay. hour after the flight was supposed to be in the air, uh, it still went smooth. So uh, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It just worked. It just worked. Somebody stepped on it. Yeah. I, I think that was the case. We might add a bit of a tailwind or something, but yeah. A good tailwind. Yeah. 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 It worked well. So yeah, cool. it was cool. a good, it was a good flight. Uh, although it, admittedly, uh, the, to have a dash eight is a very small aircraft. Uh, there is leg room. The seats aren't very wide because the, the, it's like, that's it. There's two each side, uh, Porter airlines, right. which I absolutely love. We have free drinks, free snacks, uh, effortless, uh, yeah, no, it was a great flight and uh, landed and I met my mom right away and then my cousin and we drove back to uh, Miramichi where I am right now, which is about 75, 80 minute drive ish, depending upon traffic. Uh, so yeah, I got in, visited with some family last night and again, uh, you know, trying to see some people I haven't seen in a while. So I thought, well, I'm, my mom's like, you haven't eaten yet. I said, just go down to Pizza Delight. I'm like, yeah, I'll just zip downtown, which is not far because it is a small town. Well, it's technically a city. Yeah. It is a city because you've got like three, four communities, uh, Newcastle, Douglastown, Chatham, Chatham Head, and then Logieville. And there's all these little communities. So it's all Miramichi City now, which has been that way for 20 plus years. But uh, yeah, I went downtown and, and uh, there's a nice little pub there, O'Donohue's, I guess it's called, which I don't remember it being a okay. pub the last time I lived here, but I haven't lived here since 1986, 86, 87. Okay. 87 was the last time I lived here. So I, I don't remember if it was a pub back then, but uh, yeah, when it sat down, had a nice locally brewed beer. Cause I said, you know, sit down. She goes, what can I get you? I'm like, do you have anything local? Because let's face it, when you're, you know, visiting a part of the country, right. even though I'm very familiar, I have tons of family here. I've, I've spent m- many summers here. Uh, this is, this is not a, a surprise to me, but uh, I, I still want to sample the local fare. So sure enough, sat down, had a really nice pale ale. Uh, no, it wasn't. A, what was it a pale? Ale? It was a Pilsner. Sorry. It was a really nice Pilsner. Mermishi. Uh, I'll get the name of the brewery because I'll have another one of those before I leave. Guarantee you. <laughs> good. good. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, great mood here. Awesome. Great mood here. Uh, nothing spectacular to report one way or the other. Um, just great mood. I, I, I'm, you know, when things go well. Mm-hmm. I don't stop and ask why, and I don't pause to interrupt. No. <laughs> I just ride the wave. Don't do so that. I'm riding the wave. Things are good. Yep. Yep. I'm just grateful. I say thank you, and I move on with my day and keep living my best That's life. That's what you should so do. Things are good. Yep. Yep. Uh, even though the computer still hasn't arrived yet. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what it is. They keep on saying it's about to ship, it's about to ship, and then we turn around, nope, not shipped yet. Because... Fortunately, yesterday, they said, we'll let you know. Mm-hmm. So uh, unlike Friday and Monday, I was not a prisoner of my house waiting for someone it's, from Amazon to arrive so I can sign for something. And exactly. So I could go out and join the world. You have to sign for this because <laughs> it's an expensive piece of equipment. They need to design for it. Here's the thing that's bugging me, though. It's like I'm at a point where, and this is being shipped directly from Amazon, not some third-party supplier. So I don't know what mm-hmm. is, is going on there. So what I may do. Is, I'm guessing it has something to do with the, the rainstorms or whatnot. Yeah, what, delayed stuff. I, I might just go in, cancel it, and then reorder it and see if that'll be quicker because this is beginning to be a pain in the butt. You know? Oh. Maybe. Maybe. I haven't okay. decided yet. I'll check into it later today and see see what the status is because it, it should have been shipped by now. My goodness, I ordered it mm-hmm. Thursday. This is Wednesday. It's been almost seven days. What happened to the uh, 24 hour uh, <laughs> delivery from Amazon that they're famous for, right? No, no not, 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 not in this case. <laughs> Clearly. Um, all right. Um, since, since we were talking about uh, the weather a little bit, um, it seems that with regard to the wildfires uh, in Jasper, um, News that I had gotten from uh, people who were uh, a little more local was seeming to indicate that uh, the entry into town might not be able to happen Mm -hmm. for another two to three weeks. It seems that that has been revised and that people will start being able to go back 
as early as Friday. Um, the people are saying that, um, well, firefighters, how would I put it? They're, they're saying that the fire is still not under control, so it's still burning out of control, but they do have it 99% contained. Okay. Um, so hoping for better, better weather and having more people down, well, might be able to bring it under control, but it is not yet under control. Um, so we have to be uh, very careful uh, for people who are returning home. It seems that uh, people who um, will be able to go back to their homes because their homes are not damaged yet uh, have to be prepared for an extremely minimal lifestyle. Uh, not all the services are up and running. Uh, and about 30% of the town uh, is destroyed. So there are 300 Count, they counted 358 dis, uh, structures that are uh, destroyed uh, mm, at the moment. That's a lot in a small town. Um, it, it really is. Um, I mean, it's not it's not as destructive yeah. as Lac Mechanitic was, but it's it's not far off because Lac Mechanitic's entire right. downtown was decimated. Like there was nothing left of it. Yeah. I mean, and there was nothing I, I'm not left, making yeah. light of what took place in Jasper at all. Please understand that I'm not oh, making no. light of it, but it just wasn't as catastrophic. It's catastrophic, no question. Not as catastrophic. Well, there were a lot more deaths than like making. That's the other well. thing too. Yeah, there nobody died in Jasper. Nobody. Yeah, nobody. Um, so, so uh, one th uh, Mayor Richard Ireland says that uh, it's opening for Jasperites, but not tourists. Mm -hmm. Quote, it's a milestone day, but that excitement needs to be tempered with the reality that we face. That reality includes buildings with smoke and water damages and house that don't yet have heat or power or drinkable water. So that's what I'm saying. Not everybody, yeah. even if their home is necessarily standing, are able to actually move back in yet and be fully serviced. Um, says uh, the, it will be a big adjustment to the res residents and they're going to need time to adapt. Uh, according to Alberta Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rick MacGyver, uh, he's saying the same thing. Jasper will be open for business soon, but not Friday. No. Um, so that's about uh, all I have right now with regard to that. Um, you know, they're trying to reconnect gas, reconnect mm -hmm. water, uh, make sure that uh, you know the the grocery stores uh, are full enough so that people can buy food, that the gas stations have enough gas for people who need it, that type of stuff. You know, that the hospital, uh, the anything hospital or anything medical that's there. Uh, might uh, still be able to be uh, offering some types of services, if not everything, you know, just some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's going to be uh, a little while before, you know, well, it, it's, it's going to be a long, long time before things get back to normal well, because uh, the third of the town is destroyed. And there's a new normal. But in terms like... It's you, a new normal, right? Yeah, exactly. It's a new normal. But before you can get to some some type of somewhat pace of regular living if you happen to have been there and the place where your work hasn't been destroyed or a business that you happen to own is still standing you know it's like, like there's a person over there that's looking to get back at his business but his business is like selling you know tour packages mm -hmm. of some kind well, that's that's on hold. not quite yet for the tourists well i, I, so, I understand the you know. cable car to whistler mountain is not open yet either mm. which is a big okay. tourist draw because that brings people right up to the top of the mountain you can hike up like you get to where the cable car drops you off, there's a restaurant, there's a bar, there's a gift shop, but then there's a 1.2 kilometer hike to the, to, to the summit. Uh, it's not 1.2 kilometers high. It's just, it's the trail to get you up there. And that the cable car is closed indefinitely, as I understand it. I do not know when it's going to open. And I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking because that is a big attraction to that area because you can see the whole valley. And it's just gorgeous. And I, as you know, I sent us, I shot some video while I was up there and posted some pictures. I still haven't sat down and, and, and put everything together because life's been a little hectic since I got back. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you got a lot going on. Yeah. So next, um, next week will be a, a full week of me doing a whole bunch of studio stuff and editing and that it's cause I have, I've cleared next week's schedule for this specifically. Perfect. Perfect. Um, we're talking about uh, leftovers from weather uh, in the province of Quebec because we they had those rains mm -hmm. um, because of from the remnants of uh, Hurricane Debbie. Um, farmers in the province of Quebec are reporting that their fields are flooded and saturation zones uh, in the area that are parts uh, that are parts of aquifers. 
are still engorged with water as a result of the amount of rain that fell uh, at the time. In the Maurice region in particular, uh, things are pretty bad and there are currently concerns about access to potable water for agriculture mm -hmm. following a breach of access, uh, following um, breaches of aqueducts uh, in, the, in the area. Uh, though the state of emergency has been lifted in most of the 55 municipalities that were the most affected, they remain in place if you happen to be in Yamashish, Wentworth, St. Didas, or St. Julien. If you're in the region of Chelsea, which is in the Utewe, mm -hmm. uh, the state of emergency there has been extended for 10 oh days. My. So uh, Chelsea got hit pretty hard. Uh, yesterday morning, not sure if it's open yet today, uh, the Dorval Tunnel on Auto Route uh, 60, uh, 13 was still closed yesterday morning because there was an accumulation of water there that was blocking access. And uh, while we were saying the, the, the weather reports were calling for about 50 to 75 millimeters of rain uh, in La Malbe, which is in the Charlevoix region, mm -hmm. one of the most beautiful mm -hmm. parts of Quebec. By the way, if you ever have a chance to go to the Charlevoix region uh, and take a trip there, Please do. Is that, uh, and, uh, if you go in the is that near uh, Ile Madeleine? Uh, no, not that far. Um, it's about. Uh, I've been. I just can't picture in my mind maybe where it three, is. Yeah, it's. Um, I've been too, but I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that. It's not that far from Trois Rivières. Okay. Um, because I was visiting family there, so yeah, it's. Um, uh, it's a seven. It's a seven-hour drive from Kingston, but it's um. Let's see, where's Le Malbe? It's a. Uh, it's right on the Saint Lawrence. On the south shore, correct. Um. On the north. It's on shore. the north shore. Okay. It's on the north shore. Um. It's close. Uh, the biggest town in the area is called Bay Saint Paul, near La Malbe, uh, like this. But it's uh, It's just past. It's maybe a, a bit past Le Massif. If you're going okay, okay, skier. yeah, yeah, I know exactly where it's it is. a little, just a little further north yeah. than the I've been there, but it's been many um, years because I'm, I'll like when I'm, I'll yeah. be driving home um, Thursday. It's, it's yeah, tomorrow. Wow, I'm just, I'm, tomorrow we'll, we'll, we'll we uh, go up through, uh, we cross over the province of New Brunswick, go up through Edmonston, up towards uh, Rivier Lou, and then we drive along the South Shore. Yes, which is a beautiful exactly. drive too, by the so, way. Uh, if you've never done it, it's gorgeous. Yeah. So if you're in Quebec City, it's about an hour and 45 minutes away. Okay. But it's just gorgeous, especially uh, if you're there in like this time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like this, uh, the fiddleheads and the, uh, what they call the super gorgan, all the local fair that like this is the time. For well, and, and whale watching too yeah, takes a place time. a lot. Yeah. Actually, it's really weird. The, the, the first time I ever, the first I remember the year I was there because it was 1984, because mm -hmm. it was the first time I had ever seen the Olympics. Uh, okay. Because in 1980, mm -hmm. I didn't see them because we were boycotted in 1976. I was, I was three years old, so even if I had seen them, I wouldn't remember them. So the first time I was introduced to the concept of the Olympics as a thing was 1984. Right. And uh, we were there. We were in La Malbe, and we were like, you know, like the TV was on. <laughs> I was like, it's like, go Sylvie Bernier. <laughs> well, no, it's, <laughs> it's the summer. Gold and diving for us. Summer Olympics were boycotted yes. in 1980. The yes. Winter Olympics took place in Lake Placid, New York. Yep, yeah, and I... I Probably wasn't uh, old enough to remember well, those either. Wasn't clued into the concept. Well, that was the miracle. The first on time ice. Winter Olympics I saw was '84 Saria. Yeah, first one I saw was Saria. Yeah. Saria. Yeah. I remember that one too well. But I remember yeah. I was I actually was watching that game, U.S. Russia. Oh, the miracle. Yeah. Well, it's, there was yeah. nothing else on. We didn't even have cable at the time, so I turn it on and I'm like, "Oh, USA and Russia. This is going to be a blowout," and it was not a blowout. <laughs> and I remember watching that right to the end. I was so excited. I'm like just because they beat the Russians. And, and, and right. at the time, team, the Soviet team, the USSR team, was the premier international hockey team on planet Earth. Yeah. They were virtually yeah. undefeatable. And they lost to a bunch of university and college kids. Kids. I think the oldest person on the team was 19 at the time. I mean, these, these were... Oh, wow. oh, yeah, they were kids. Yeah, absolutely. 19, maybe 20. They were all... I think 90% of them were from Minnesota. <laughs> of course yeah now <laughs> well in 1980 that <laughs> yeah. was the state of hockey in north america in, in the united states of america it was mostly northern northern states there were of course new york and boston yeah. 
you know, New York and Boston, but it was primarily Minnesota is where the, the American hockey players came out of. I mean, it's completely different now. You look at Austin Matthews, who scored 60 goals this year, 59 goals. He's from Las Vegas. Yeah. So it's the, the demographic yeah. has changed quite a bit since then. But yeah, I remember that. Yeah. I remember that game well. And it was, I've, I've watched documentaries on it. I watched the movie Miracle and, and I still get the goosebumps every time I watch the documentaries or the film about, I get that same feeling. And I remember watching that thinking Craig Patrick is the greatest goaltender I've ever seen. He played the absolute best game of his entire life that day. He was never as good again, but it didn't matter. He did what he had to do on that day. What I say, when you achieve your personal best in that high moment when everybody's watching, mm -hmm. because that's the summit of human achievement yep. for an individual. It is. Um, so talking about La, La Malbe, um, while everywhere else got 50 to 75 millimeters, um, according to environment and climate change, 135 millimeters of rain fell in Bay St. Paul. That's a lot. <laughs> um, there's a picture here. Um, I'm not sure if you're, you have the ability to put it up. Yeah, I can. But uh, this is the Rivière du Gouffre. Might take a second, but uh, there you go. Which reported, which reported major flooding. Uh, as you can see, it's like right at the bank. Wow. That is extremely high water uh, there. Uh, so a uh, flood protection wall was installed Sunday afternoon in a residential area to seal shovel house sealed. Let's try that again. I'm talking like Trump. A flood protection wall was installed Sunday afternoon in a residential area to shield several houses from the rising waters. She sells seashells down by the seashore. Okay. On Sunday morning, <laughs> the Rivière du Gouffre in Saint-Urbain, north of Bay Paul, reported major flooding. A chalet was swept away by the waters, officials say. Uh, the situation reminiscent of uh, this past summer when heavy rain swelled rivers in the region and two volunteer firefighters died after being swept away by rushing floodwaters. I remember reporting on that. Mm. Uh, in St. Simeon, uh, further northeast in the region, an accommodation center was opened as a precaution for residents in case the situation deteriorates, according to Mayor Sylvain Tremblay. No one has utilized it as of Sunday afternoon. Again, you'll have people being critical. Oh, wow, I can't believe we spent all that money in opening a center that nobody used. Again, I repeat, in an emergency mm -hmm. and in a pandemic, when it's done, if your impression was, gee, they overreacted, that means they did well. That's the key. Means the good yeah. Because there's always going to be the people who levels. scream that you overreacted. Just it. like that means we saved lives. Period. Yes. We did what was necessary. It's better. It's better to overreact and have it in case somebody needs it mm -hmm. than underreact and not have it when people do. So okay. true. Officials say water. That that's why we pay the taxes. Yeah, exactly. Officials say water levels in the Charlevoix region should start to drop around 4 p.m. Uh, that was uh, yesterday. Oh, nope. sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm <laughs> just looking at the article. Uh, and I went back. I, I apologize, kits and cubs. Uh, this article for some reason, even though I searched it and looked for it, I forgot to read the date, is from October 2023. Well, you can throw that one in And not garbage. just now. <laughs> so everything I just said... Throw it out. <laughs> Disregard it. You you need a coffee what this morning, hell? sir. I just... Seriously. I, that is really weird. Well, in other news... Uh, Air Canada, Air Canada pilots may go on strike on September 17th if they don't reach a, if they don't reach a new collective bargaining agreement, which would affect a lot of people. Uh, but it's okay. I mean, pay them, just, just pay them, just go to the table, negotiate a deal and make it happen before we have to have a disruption. CN, uh, case, uh, CPKC and CN rail are looking at going on strike as well, which would halt all freight uh, trains over the next little while, which is bad. That would bring the entire country to its knees in seconds, because if they're not shipping freight of any type, we've got a problem. Yep. Uh, in fact, uh, when it comes to that, it appears that, um, CP, um, which has a, a new name, 
CPKC. CPKC. It yeah, it's Canadian Pacific, Kansas City. CPKC. Okay. Yeah, they merged with Kansas City Rail was, Lines. Well, that was a, a number of years ago they did that, but uh, yeah, they just called it CPKC and they didn't really talk about it a lot. But yeah, that's what it is. They merged with Kansas City Railways when they were taken over by a uh, an American. Well, I, I wouldn't say taken over. They were merged and an American CEO for KC Railways uh, started to run the whole company. I remember reading about that a number of years ago. He said, uh, railroading's in my blood. <laughs> So it seems that uh, even though uh, the strike or lockout hasn't uh, started yet because the rail companies are threatening to lock out the workers on this one, Canadian National Railway Company says in an internal memo obtained by the Canadian press that the company has begun to embargo some hazardous goods from the U.S. in anticipation of a work stoppage. So goods are already... Yeah, it's already begun. Uh, the flow of goods has already begun. CN says it plans to bar more commodities this week if no agreement with workers is reached. On Friday, Canadian Pacific Kansas City Limited said it will temporarily ban traffic of dangerous materials to ensure none wind up stranded on the tracks in the event of job action. The two railways warned last week that they will lock out some 9,300 engineers, conductors, and yard workers on August 22nd unless they find common ground on a new contracts after negotiations stalled over scheduling and wages. Shippers and producers say a work stoppage would snarl the country's supply chain, halting freight traffic and disrupting industries. So uh, that has come up. And then with, uh, I found this in global, this is probably more about the negotiations itself. Um, so but the first article was from iPolitics. Mm -hmm. um, the two country's two main railways and their workers remain at loggerheads over scheduling, safety, or salaries, depending on who you ask, as the clock ticks down on contract negotiations. Um, on Friday was the <clears throat> day that both companies uh, warned that they would lock out uh, employees if they couldn't reach an agreement. The Teamsters Canada Rail Conference, TCRC, which represents 9,300 engineers, conductors, yard workers, and rail traffic controllers, claimed that the CP, CPKC, Canadian Pacific Kansas City, wants to, quote, quote, gut the collective agreement of all safety critical fatigue provisions. We've talked about Safety this. critical fatigue provisions are the th that were gutted was exactly what caused lack megantic along with uh, the derailment that took place just outside of palestine uh, pennsylvania last year yes yes as well yes cn has targeted fewer points linked to fatigue the teamster said but has also proposed what the union called quote a forced relocation scheme that would see some employees move to far-flung locations for several months at a time to fill labor gaps quote from the very beginning, rail workers have only ever sought a fair and equitable agreement. Unfortunately, both rail companies are demanding concessions that could tear families apart or jeopardize rail safety, said Teamsters President Paul Boucher in a statement Friday. The railways have put forward two different sets of offers each, stating that they all comply with safety rules, a point the union has not denied. One CN proposal would see employees on a scheduled 40-hour work week with at least 10 to 12 hours of rest between shifts, depending on whether they're at home or away and either two or three consecutive days off each week in compliance with the law. The schedule approach to shifts, a comparable offer was tabled by CPKC before being withdrawn conditionally on Friday, would mark a drastic change from the mileage-based system of pay that has been in place for decades at both companies. If accepted, the new arrangement would make for more predictability for workers and managers, the railway says. But if an employee reached their destination hours ahead of time, it would also mean they could be assigned to other tasks rather than clocking out on arrival. Quote, none of CN's offers compromised safety in any way. The latest offer proposed third-party arbitration, the Montreal-based railway said in a release Friday, adding that the union has made no counter-proposals. The union has turned down offers of binding arbitration from both railways. CN said it also extended an offer that aligns more with the framework of the current contract and includes pay bumps. Likewise, Canadian Pacific uh, Kansas said the sticking points for its status quo proposal revolve around wages as well as held-away pay income that kicks in after a certain number of hours off shift in a spot that is not the worker's home terminal. It's reasonable. Calorie-based railroad operator. It's reasonable. Yep. Want, yep. Wants to push back the start time on that pay, an adjustment made in response to the longer rest period times mandated by, mandated by tighter federal regulations. Quote, the status quo style offer fully complies with the new regulatory requirements for rest and does not in any way compromise safety, CPKC said in a release Friday. 
In May 2023, new rules came into effect that raised the minimum rest period between shifts to 10 hours at home and 12 hours when away, versus the previous 6 and 8 hours respectively. They also capped freight workers' maximum shift length at 12 hours down from 16. These are very, very good changes from the federal yeah, government. No Again, Canada has not broken. This is doing the stuff right. In a ruling last Friday, the National Labor Tribunal ordered a 13-day cooling-off period as part of a pair of decisions that deemed rail services non-essential, opening the door to a full-fledged work stop stoppage as early as next week. So that's what's going on with the rail. And, 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 uh, and what, what, is it, to what is it management is trying to do here? Why are they trying to change this? And why are they going to lock these people out? Because I'll give you, I'll give you, a, it's a, it's a, a, a three-syllable word. Starts with share, ends with holders. Mm -hmm. It's like literally, it's like shareholders want a larger return on every, uh, I need a bigger dividend check every quarter. Well, how can we trim, yeah, so how can we trim costs? Let's get rid of people. Let's, let's get rid of people. Let's either get rid of people or get rid of, rid of, rid of uh, consumer and citizen protections. That's what it is. Thank you. It's the first, two places, it's the first two places they go. That's it. Uh, because that causes us money, that hurts to, our bottom line. Yeah, but you got to understand, we have rules and regulations that have been put in place over decades of research experience. We have unions to protect yeah. people. Like if there was a time when a uh, hundred, a hundred and twenty years ago, children were working in meatpacking plants. Yep. In some states in the United States of America, they've brought them back in. Yeah. They're bringing well, back child labor. And like Megan Tick, they cut the staff down from two that were necessary on a train to one. To one. one person had to do all the handbrake things on all well, on, and you recognize, on a huge rail. It, it, sometimes it was those are two, two or three kilometers. Yeah. It, and it was taking them like two or three hours to do it after it's like after a whole after a full shift come mm -hmm. like listen, cutting from two to one. It's ridiculous. But there was nobody out there that thought, thought, you know, hey, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe there should be a second person to like even just check. It's like is double check down, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, at some point they get really ridiculous when it's like, well, we need to, we, we could make that leaner. We can do that with fewer people. No, sometimes some, you need some built in redundancy now and then. Well, I'll give you, for instance, here in the line of work that I was in for many, many years, there were often times where we were scheduled to go into a building to install a piece of equipment. <clears throat> and there was this company that we were contracted to out of the U.S. who said, uh, just go in and install it. And I'm like, uh, no, he goes, what do you mean? No. And I was I was the, the, the regional manager at the time I said, no, we don't just send people in to install it. First, we have to notify the building manager. We have to notify the client and we have to talk to security to get access. He goes, oh, let's, I've, it's just go. I'm like, no, no, no. So let me take care of all that. I take care of all of that. And I said, oh, I, I noticed here you're saying it's one technician. He goes, yeah. I go, no, it's not. It's two technicians. Why? Because it's after hours. It's after 4 p.m. There's nobody in the building. So if we send one technician and he gets up the ladder and falls, he's going to lie there for three days because it's a Friday evening. I go, that's in violation of the law. He goes, no, it's not. And I go, yeah, I think I know the law in Canada for labor, for what we do in my line of work. Do not dictate to me how to do things in my country, in my line of work. I am an expert at this. So we are sending two men or we're sending nobody. You make your decision. And he got really upset with me. Best part was my GM called me back and said, you did the right thing. He says, That's we good. value our people. We're not sending a single person in there totally alone on a Friday evening. Any number of things could happen. What if a piece of equipment suddenly went missing? They immediately point the finger of blame at us. If he falls and hurts himself, we're the ones getting in trouble. And mm -hmm. this man could be seriously injured. So it's like cutting back on safety regulations to save a few bucks will cost you a hundredfold more. Because you only have to be wrong once. Once, just once. And Black Meganetic is a prime example. Yep. That's a prime a example. Yep. Yeah. So stop yep. cutting corners to shave a few percentage points so you can return a, a larger dividend check to your shareholders each month when you realize that people's lives are way more important than a couple of bucks. When is that going to happen? Probably never because we have greedy people who need more, more, more for me, 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 who run this world. And we, you, I, and every kitten cub here, everybody watching or listening, 
We are the people who will make the change so that that doesn't happen anymore. Our voices need to be heard. And where do we make them heard? At the ballot box every time we vote. There you go. Well said, Mr. Wesley. Uh, with Thank regard you. to Air Canada, the union representing Air Canada pilots is preparing for a possible strike next month, as Mr. Grizzly mentioned. Frustrated pilots at Air Canada are beginning to wear lanyards and pins with the message, strike ready, written on them. The union and airline have been at the bargaining table for more than a year. The head of the union, Charlene Hoodie, says the big issue includes scheduling and compensation. Quote, we've seen a large gap between ourselves and our American counterparts. Right now, some of my American counterparts are making twice as much as I do and the pilots that I represent. Pilots are now voting on whether to give the union a strike mandate. They've been without a contract since September of last year. So they've been negotiating for 11 months and have gotten nowhere. I don't know how you negotiate for 11 months and get nowhere on a contract thing. I just, I really don't. Um, negotiations have included a mediator. Uh, the head of the union says, quote, we are far apart. The airline says it is to finalize, the, it hopes to finalize the deal over the next several weeks. Any job action would be uh, the latest uh, in headaches for the airline industry following the sudden closure of Lynx Air, a uh, strike by Westchester Mechanics, and uh, severe weather having damaged the terminal and planes at Calgary Airport. Um, Rick Erickson, who is an aviation analyst, is quoted as saying, there's seemingly some kind of a crisis going on somewhere. It's just the nature of the airline sector here in Canada. Clearly, pilots at Air Canada have watched other pilots at other airlines, particularly in the U.S., gain very substantive benefits. And uh, as you mentioned, the earliest they can strike is September 17th. So that's what we have going on in terms of labor action. <coughs> now, there's another bit of labor news, um, which is, a little interesting, uh, but for, for whole other reasons. Uh, it seems that the federal government uh, had nominated a certain person to become the head, uh, the chief commissioner or the president of uh, the Canadian Human Rights Commission. Okay. And um, it seems that this may not have been the best choice, uh, but it doesn't seem that anybody did anything wrong from what we can tell other than the person themselves um, who had uh, applied for the job. Uh, and who was that? According here, I have it to, to Reuters, but I had uh, some notes that I'd uh, taken down. Uh, a gentleman oh, okay. named uh, Berju Datani uh, had been retained to get the job, and then he was supposed to start work last week and uh, took some time off <clears throat> instead of starting because it would oh, yes, appear yes, yes, yes. that uh, this person had a social media history of saying some things that are considered quite inflammatory and that some may consider somewhat anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. uh, he was writing a lot about uh, the situation in Israel uh, during 2010, not what's going on right now, uh, and also went to several events and made presentations um, saying these things. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, all the social media posts were made under an alias, and so were the live presentations. So under a different name than his own, when he applied. So everybody did the searches, I'm guessing, didn't see anything because nothing popped up under his name. And then there was some investigative reason. Somebody brought it to the attention. There was an investigation. And uh, he seems that uh, when the investigation found these things, he decided, ooh, uh, maybe I won't start just yet. I'll take some time off. And uh, now it seems that um, rather than having the government officially revoke the nomination, because that makes the press too, and there goes the rest mm -hmm. of his career pretty much, uh, he has decided to voluntarily step down. So I'm guessing somebody got a phone call that says, oh, we could either revoke your domination or um, you can step aside. agree to go sleepy bye-bye. Yeah. So uh, he decided to do that. Um, 
Why, why wasn't this done before he was given the job? Well, because it was all under aliases. So apparently they did all the checks, uh, okay, but okay. when they looked under his name, they, they looked, they took they his name nothing. and they looked at his social media feeds and they looked at what he'd done and they found nothing. And I was like, so how oh. did they find the aliases though? Who found that? Who did the digging? Good on them. Yes. That part I haven't heard in the news report. So hopefully I'll, it'll be in this article here, uh, from Reuters. Uh, Canada's new chief human rights commissioner resigned before he even officially began the role following an investigation into his appointment and controversy over past remarks he made about Israel. Birju Datani announced his resignation on a LinkedIn post Monday saying, quote, I have agreed to resign as chief commissioner of the Canadian Human Rights Commission effective today. He would have been the first Muslim person to head uh, the organization. Okay. I remain a steadfast believer in the commission's work mandate and its importance for, to, for our democracy. Canadian Human Rights Commission operates independent of the federal government, and it looks into the human rights complaints against Canada's federal government, among other things. Canada's Justice Minister Arif Varani said in a statement he accepted Datani's decision. As I have said, maintaining the confidence of all Canadians in the Canadian Human Rights Commission remains my top priority, he said, adding that a process to appoint a new chief commissioner will begin as soon as possible. Datani was appointed in June, but his appointment was met with opposition from some Jewish groups. So some Jewish groups brought it to the attention. It says, oh, wait a minute, this guy? Do you know that he publishes under an alias? Mm -hmm. Now, this is the second time now. <clears throat> hey, guys, because remember I'm the looking funding? for work right now. <laughs> I could use a new job. Hi. <laughs> Actually, I'm not kidding. I would, I would happily take that position. But you, if you remember, I think it was last year, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Uh Yes, last year, uh, some guy named Leith Marouf uh, had been uh, got a contract from Canadian Heritage uh, because he was working with the Com Community Media Advocacy Center, and it got got, got that group got one hundred twenty two thousand for projects to help combat racism. And then it was sort of like, um, do you know who that person that will be running that program is? And then big scandal. Like Laura, Lori Goldstein of the Sun, like milked that for about three months, and was you know, trying to paint the government as being anti-Semitic because they gave the contract to this guy. So clearly, there probably needs to be some changes to way thing way things are vetted. Um, but I mean, as well in this second case, if people are going to be masking their identity, and then mm -hmm. in the interview process as a the minister uh, said, uh, lack candor. This is one of the reasons I guess, um, you know, do you have any, because I'm sure in these types of uh, job, uh, job interviews, um, do you have anything in your past? Presentations, social media posts, videos that may be found if somebody breaks and enters into your home and put on, <laughs> do you have anything that might cause embarrassment? To the commission and the federal government? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, not at all. No, 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 not a thing. Not. Oops. <laughs> so, yes, among other things, he was accused of tweeting, quote, Palestinians are Warsaw ghetto prisoners of today and participating in panels on Israel Apartheid Week and the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The investigation into him found that he did not harbor any beliefs that would be characterized as anti-Semitic. That's good, at least. Mm -hmm and that he did yeah. not demonstrate any biases towards Jews or Israelis. It, however, took issue with his failure to disclose in his application his use of a second name, Mujahid Datani. So, his name is, going back, Birju Datani, but he did all of these presentations and all these posts under Mujahid Datani. Okay. Yeah, that's why they didn't find it. The investigation report it said it found Datani's explanation on why Mujahid Datani was not listed under the other names he used lacked credibility. In a July 30th first letter to Datani, Varani wrote, quote, based on the findings the report contains, I wish to inform you that I have significant concerns related to your candor during the process that led to your appointment. And now he's gone. Justifiably so. The so. system worked. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if the system worked a little earlier, but like I said, in mm -hmm. this case, if someone is going to lie and disguise their identity, there, there's only so much one can do. Whereas Laith Maruf, it was under Laith Maruf and it was all there for people to see. Yeah. Like, 
So, so not similar <clears throat> situations, but not necessarily equivalent, uh, and probably why there isn't as much uproar about this because you would expect the conservatives to be all over this like they were yeah. on the Lace the Roof thing, and there hasn't been that much uh, with regard yeah. to that. But so, don't lie on your resumes and don't lie in your job interviews, kids and cubs. Period. Oh. It'll come back to haunt you. Okay. Can we, can we go back you, and to if the... You, and if you have stuff in your past like this, that disclose it. embarrassment to you, what like, either disclose it or don't apply or step aside. job. It's not for you. Yeah, it's, it's simple as that. You. I'd like to step back to the uh, the labor things we were talking about a few minutes ago, if we could. Uh, something uh, Mr. Jim said uh, that that I can attest to. It's very true. He says, uh, you know, they they want you to do something that's in violation of safety codes, uh, rules, and regulations, and they'll, you're lucky to have a job. I have been told, after I pointed out to the boss that what you are asking me to do is not only dangerous but highly illegal, because I just took the course two days prior. Two days prior. I said, what you're asking me to do is not only in violation of the safety rules and regulations, but I can get fined up to $5,000. You'll get 50 and the boss will get 250 and possible jail time. Well, Paul, you know, there are lots of people sitting at home right now that don't have work. Yeah, and then PNC Bio pointed out that he's heard that same statement, you're lucky to have a job, said to CTOs and CFOs. So what does that tell you? We still very much need unions to oh, protect yeah. people from bad managers like that who threaten you, threaten your job and, you know, dangle the carrot of, well, you're lucky to have a job. These are not, these are not good times. We need labor and white collar unions just as much today as we did 50, 60, 70 years ago. And as a matter of fact, I'd say even more so today than we did 50 years ago. And I mean that. I genuinely mean that because I look at the abuses that take place to, on people and, and, and as evidenced by our temporary foreign workers, which is basically legalized slavery. It's a form of slavery. They bring people in, they house them and they warehouse them, and then they pay them less than minimum wage. We need labor unions now just as much as we needed them 50 years ago. Yep. And you got to remember, too, labor unions post-World War II is what created the middle class in this country. It's what mm -hmm. created the middle class in the United States of America. It's what made us two of the most powerful economies on Earth. I mean, Canada is doing very, very well, economically speaking, and we can do better. Too. Yes, we punch well above our weight. We're Canadian. We always do that. Mm. We well, always I mean do that. We're only 150 something years old and it's like, and we're already among like the top 12, 157. Economies. Yeah. Like this. And we're yeah. already among the top one. Like some people, some countries have been around for way longer. Um, yeah. yeah. And there's 41.5 million of us and growing every day. So yeah, we need more labor unions. We need to be able to push back on management that wants to harm the people that generate their revenue stream. Mm-hmm. I'm yep. starting to sound like I'm going to rise up, but uh, this is this is a deeply passionate thing for me because it affects it not only affects me directly, it it affects people that I've worked with over the decades, and I've seen how uh, people have been hurt and harmed on the job, and they're like, "Oh, we'll do everything to make sure." No, you, you should have done it in the first place, so that didn't happen. If the, the if the protections were put in place and you obeyed the rules and regulations, that person wouldn't have gotten hurt to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm seeing like some uh, some things uh, from the the kits here. Uh, Kit Carol says, uh, "Hubby's a contractor. Many have told him just pay. Uh, we'll just pay you in time off. Don't report it as a work injury when it happened." Yeah, um, yeah. Because and uh, that uh, the UAW uh, in the United States is uh, suing Elon Musk and Trump for their union busting talk during their uh, little chat. Uh, also during their little chat, it seems that uh, Ronald Rompros mentioned something about. Uh, if uh, he loses the election, he's going to go to Venezuela, uh, which, uh, you know, if you're under um, criminal investigation and you've got trials saying out loud that you're a flight risk, probably yeah. not the smartest move, Donnie. Donald. Um, but back to the what you were talking about, to temporary foreign workers, um, just so happens that um, a UN special rapporteur recently studied this 
and uh, announced, specifically said, Canada's reliance on temporary foreign workers is, quote, a breeding ground for contemporary forms of slavery. The damning report for the UN, UN investigator from the UN investigator Tomoya Obukata found that deep power imbalances and discriminatory practice in Canada cuts costs for companies but exploits workers from the global south. Uh, the rapporteur toured Ottawa, Moncton, Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver to study the decades-long program, which relies heavily on workers from Mexico, Guatemala, and Jamaica. Throughout the country, he found workers were locked in debt bondage. Many had borrowed money to participate in the program and relied on their Canadian wages to repay accrued debts. He also heard testimony of widespread emotional and physical abuse, wage theft, hazardous mm -hmm. work conditions, long hours, sexual harassment, and exploitation. What did I tell you? Yep. Quote, the special rapporteur retains the view that the temporary foreign worker program serves as a breeding ground for contemporary forms of slavery as it institutionalized asymmetries of power that favor employees and employers and prevent workers from exercising the rights. Under the current rules, Canada's temporary foreign worker program allows companies to bring in four workers for sectors when an employer is not able to find local workers. In the past, the agricultural sector has relied heavily on seasonal migrant workers, and just a few days ago, we were talking about one farm that apparently has brought somebody in, has some workers that have been in every year, like for 21 years. That's Those are full-time employees. No. no. Those are full-time seasonal so, so, employees. Those are full-time seasonal so, employees. This, this program was brought in under the Harper government, was it not, or the Cretchen government? Either way, here, here's the thing. Right now, who's the current government? The Liberal Party. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, and who's the current Minister of Labor? Is it still Sean, or has he stepped down yet? Uh, he stepped down as Labor. Yes, I believe it is um, Stephen McKinnon, who's now the Minister of okay. Labor. Because we reported that. Mr. He, he would maintain He would maintain the same attitude that... Uh, uh, Seamus O'Regan had with regard to Seamus, government thank not you. interfering. Well, Mr. McKinnon and uh, Mr. Trudeau, Prime Minister Trudeau and Minister McKinnon, get up off your duff and fix this problem now. This is bad. This mm -hmm. is bad for Canada's image. This is bad for Canada's reputation. This mm -hmm. is bad on a human level. Mm -hmm. Get out there and fix it right now. We're yep. calling you out on this. Oh yeah, absolutely. And remember, and, for those of us who think we're we're strong liberal stall, no, we do not support any particular party. We don't. Well, you're actually a member of the Conservative Party. Not anymore. It lapsed. Oh yeah. Okay. Right. You were. I you, mean, yeah, that's right. You were. Yeah. You had a you had a membership for one reason and one reason only to vote against Pierre Polyev becoming the the the, the party leader. Yes, uh, because I was encouraging everybody else to do it, and it would be kind of hypocritical for me not to do it myself. Right. right. Well, and, and, and I, I encourage people, but I also said I cannot do it because of the position I was in. I, I was working for a Crown Corp, so I cannot do that. Yes. But as I've said time and time again, neither you nor I belong to a party other than the, you know your one-year period. Uh, and, and we always support the best candidate in our writing, regardless of party. Although yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, the caveat being the current Conservative Party is not the Conservative Party. It's not the Progressive Conservative Party anymore. It's the Reform Party. So though. They'll probably not get our vote, but we do have three other choices, Liberal, NDP, and Green to vote for, or perhaps an independent. But what I'm trying to say here is, for those of us who always accuse us of, of, of being soy boy cock liberal supporters, we're calling out the Liberal Party of Canada and the Prime Minister directly on this. Yes, we are. Directly on this. And uh, the thing about to be happy you have a job also works uh, here as well. Because often uh, some of these employers, uh, when um, the migrant workers get a little too uppity, uh, remind them that um, we can always just send you back, you know. Yes. We don't need you specifically. There's a lot of other people who would like to come and take your place and work under these conditions if you're not happy. So, um, yeah, that gets used there too. Be happy you have this job. Um, oh, under the current rules, uh, Canada's temporary foreign worker programs allow companies to bring in four workers for sectors when an employer is not able to find local workers. Last year, employers were approved to hire 239,646 temporary foreign workers, more than double the 108,988 hired in 2018. Maybe it's because people are not paying people well enough or not willing to, if it you needs think? to double up that much. Because uh, with the levels of immigration that we have, we should definitely have enough bodies. You think? You think. <laughs> um, employers like, are without having to double the number of temporary yeah. foreign workers, right? Um, 
employers are increasingly using the program to fill positions in new sectors, including in fast food and construction. The number of people hired for low-wage jobs in the healthcare sector is up more than 15,000% since 2018. Yeah, 15,000%. Not 1,500, 15,000%. For low-wage jobs in the healthcare sector. Because we don't want to pay Canadians what they're worth to do the jobs. So we'll hire somebody from another part of the world who's desperate for work to send money home, but they can't send money home because they're basically indentured servants because of the fact that they're in debt to get here, and then we pay them less than minimum wage. Canada, this is embarrassing. Prime Minister during Trudeau, cor- Minister McKinnon, you need to put an end to this right now. Right now. During the during the coronavirus pandemic, Canadians got a glimpse of the abuse and exploitation of rampant uh, within a system long ignored by residents. During the coronavirus pandemic, Canadians got a glimpse of the abuse and exploitation of rampant? Uh, there were what is it rampant with these, abuse. These new- no, no, I know that. Yeah. But there just, was abuse. That, I, I've, seen, I've seen videos of temporary foreign workers on farms that were being... F- verbally assaulted and and i mean threatened i've seen oh, yeah. some some hidden footage right yeah no it's just the sentence has written this is like the, the like the third or fourth time in about two weeks that i'm reading directly from an article and there's probably like written by chat gpt structure. yeah there's a sentence thing this and it's like i'm sorry kids it's like sometimes it's it's my when i'm listening to something i'm using um, a voice to text thing to transcribe because it goes faster than me writing it down by hand, but I usually go back and reread and then correct the words, the mistakes. But the, this, I'm actually reading from a newspaper article in the Guardian. That that mistake is there, so I apologize. So that, this that's okay. This commentary, this comment here from Linda: temporary workers on the local farms make regular yes. use of the food pantry we set up in our little community, which is leading to the conservative saying something like this: "Hey, these things should be for Canadians only, and if they need to come there, send them back." No, no they're saying pay that. Like them enough. Strict... Oh. Yeah. Yes, yes. Have them come over here, but then don't let them access that because that's supposed to be that's supposed to be for old stocks only, right? Or citizens only. It's like if you bring people here and you're not prepared to house or feed them, you shouldn't be bringing them here. Humans have two instincts: survive, reproduce. Those are two basic instincts. Do whatever you got to mm-hmm. do to survive and make more of yourself. <laughs> Those are the two things we are genetically programmed to do. Mm-hmm. If you're going to bring people here and you're not going to feed them and you're not going to house them, don't be surprised if they show up at the food bank. And if you're going to block them access to the food bank, then don't be surprised that they start breaking into cars. Well, and if, you, people if, you pay them, if you pay them so little that they can't afford Oh, here's the thing. So they put them in a in like a bunkhouse usually, right? <clears throat> For yeah, farm. And there's several of them. And they, they, yeah, several people in a bunkhouse, which no is. No air conditioning. Yeah. And, and, and they charge them rent for a bunkhouse. Mm-hmm. In a work, it's effectively a work camp, and and many of us are familiar with work camps. Are they send you up north? You're up there for three weeks, then you're off for two weeks. You're up there for four weeks, off for two weeks. People fly in and out. I've had friends who've worked on oil rigs who've told me about this, and in, uh, in offshore the Hibernia platform in Newfoundland, they fly in, they fly to Vegas, like they'll literally fly into St. John's, hop on a plane to Vegas for a couple of days, and then come back. But the work camps there are are much better. The food is much better. The conditions are much better and you're paid well. What what's happening here is exploitive labor. It's exploiting humanity. It's basically modern slavery. Mm -hmm. Call it what it is. Yep. Chris Ramasurup of justice for migrant workers said the rights group had long raised concerns over exploitation of worker and that Obokata's report was a day of reckoning for sectors that have long relied on cheap labor and turned a blind eye to reports of abuse and discrimination. Quote, our frustration is not just about the exploitation, but it's about the racial dehumanization these workers face, he said, adding that he were poli- worried that politicians, quote, might weaponize criticism of the program. We worry this could be fuel for the fire when it comes to the xenophobia and racism targets people with precarious imag- immigration. Sorry, we are sorry. We are, let's try that again. We worry this could be fuel for the fire when it comes to the xenophobia and racism that targets people with precarious immigration status. Again, there was an error in that sentence as well. 
mm-hmm. the word this one. Chat GBT. Chat GBT. And it's tripping me up. Ramasarup said injured workers were docked pay or forced to return to the fields before they were healthy. Quote, if they try to get access to healthcare or workplace compensation, they're sent back. We download our healthcare system onto the countries of Global South. Despite political pledges to make changes to the system, nothing has changed, absolutely nothing, said Ramasarup. Under the program, work permits are tied to a specific employer preventing workers from seeking better paying jobs. If it was at least a work permit that if you went to one of these employers and you weren't being treated well and you can shop yourself around now that I'm here to another farm, another farmer, that would be to the advantage of the workers. But no, they're specifically tied to the actual employer. So if they're mistreated there, their options are stay and be abused or go home. Mm-hmm. Not since you're here, find yourself a better situation, as everybody else is allowed to do, to find a better situation. And while they pay into the country's social assistance program, they are unable to access it, prompting a recent $500 million class action lawsuit. The legal action, which has not been yet certified, alleges elements of the program breach the Charter of Rights for Workers because migrant workers, even though they are not Canadian citizens while they are in Canada, the Canadian Charter of Human Rights applies to them. Yes. Obokata As well said, it should. Yes. Obokata said the only way to end the exploitation was to grant workers permanent resident status, a move the federal government has so far re- resisted. Instead, Canada's employment minister has pledged stricter and more rigorous oversight and the possibility of sector-specific work permits. But uh, here's the thing again. If, for example, you're one of those workers on that farm who's come here every year for 21 years, if you are good enough to work here, you are good enough to stay here. Yeah. Yeah. So what have I been saying for years now? I meet people all the time who've, who've come to Ottawa from different parts of the world. And I'm like, oh, okay, nice to meet you. And you've been here how long? And you still don't have your citizenship? I said, well, that's wrong. See, if you can spend wolf, one full calendar year in Ottawa, one Ottawa summer, one Ottawa winter, and you still want to stay here, here's your passport. <laughs> because as you know, Mr. Mr. Beaver, Ottawa is a difficult city to live in year round. It's a beautiful city. I love it. It's my. It's where I want to live. It's why it's I live there. Well, but 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 the the winter is difficult, and the summer is well brutally hot. It's not for everybody. But if you can stomach it and still want to stay, well, why are we why are we holding up? Like literally, here's your passport. Thanks. <laughs> yep. So uh, Ramasarapa concludes by saying, "We cannot continue the system of indentured labor. We should never have." one in the first place and we can profit off we can't profit off the blood sweat and tears and sacrifices no. of black and brown workers of the global south no we so, cannot there you go uh, we are we are well, not good this is who we are right this is who we are and we can't allow this to continue we need to make an end we need to end this as quickly as possible because it's just it's so wrong on so many levels it's destructive it's deadly it's dangerous it's harmful it hurts the brand of canada it, it's a it's a, a black eye on the nation, globally speaking, that we allow this to continue and turn a blind eye to it. I mean, this just it it's really a stick in my craw, if you will. Right like I just I, I can't I can't I cannot stomach this. I mean it. I like I can we get an interview with Mr. McKinney? Can we get an interview with the Prime Minister? Because I want to know why this is continuing. I'll put I want to know why it's continuing. Please. I, I, I want to know. And I'm going to ask him, why is this continuing? Why is this happening? Mr. Jim made, made a comment earlier. He says, I think it's less about regulation and, and more about enforcement. Yes, but the, the laws in this case, they're legally allowed to pay them less money. Yeah. Under the temporary foreign program, they're allowed to pay them. I think it's $2 less than minimum wage. So that's a problem. If they're paid less than, and remember, I've said it a thousand times, the minimum wage is not the minimum you're legally allowed to pay somebody. It's the minimum you need to exist. And if they're paying them less than what it requires to exist, and to begin with, that existing uh, statement of minimum to exist, it's not even a real thing anymore. And it depends on what part of the country you're in. $17 an hour in, in a small town in southern Ontario might be able to get you by. If you're working in Toronto or Ottawa, mm-mm, nope, nope, yep, yep. Uh, I know we have to close off soon. I uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things very quickly. 
Um, if you are following the situation uh, politically in the United States, it seems that there is a little shift uh, on the question of who's better for the economy, because I think we just talked about it a day or two ago. But it seems that uh, in July, there was a polling uh, being done, and uh, only 35% of those surveyed trusted the Democratic Party ticketed ticket headed by President Biden to handle the economy best. At that time, uh, Trump and the Republicans were at 41%. Well, August polling shows that Harris has taken the lead 42 to 41. That's up seven points with Trump and the Republicans remaining steady. But what's more interesting is where the shift appears to be coming from. In July, 18% of those surveys said they trusted neither candidate. In August, that dropped to 10%. So 8% more trust at least one of the two candidates. Trump did not go up at all. And Harris went up 7%. So it's almost all to the benefit of Harris. And that means those are the independents and the swing voters, the people that everybody is fighting over for, the 70,000 or 100,000 votes in three states or something that everybody's fighting for that will make all the difference. It seems that where it makes all the difference, more of them seem to be indicating that they trust the Democrats on the economy more than the Republicans. Um, so this is... a uh, Good news for people uh, who are looking uh, for uh, not a change <laughs> in government party in the United States and for uh, to push back the right. Uh, as well, it seems that in uh, Wisconsin specifically, uh, there were some ballot measures because they had some primaries there. And uh, state legislators uh, from the Republican Party in Wisconsin tried to have a ballot measure that would give state legislators equal say with the governor on spending federal money. And it seems that voters soundly rejected that, meaning that the current Democratic governor of Wisconsin, Tony Avery, mm -hmm. keeps control over the discretionary funds. Uh, people are saying, um, gee, I'm wondering if this type of enthusiasm is going to translate to November. Because Wisconsin is one of those swing states. And right now it seems that the people of Wisconsin, a couple of months before November, uh, don't trust their GOP lawmakers enough to want to have them to have equal say on how money is spent than the governor does. Um, that's usually not a good sign. Uh, and finally, in international news, uh, the Prime Minister of Japan, Fumio, Fushida, uh, Fumio Kishida, says that he will not be running for re-election. He says his decision to step aside is the most obvious way to show that his party will change because the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan has been marred with controversy, including fundraising scandals. And Kashida's approval rating has plummeted in recent months. And if you think that Justin Trudeau has it bad, um, a July poll found that just 25% of voters approved of his administration. Oh, wow. Uh, so again, they're talking about passing the torch to a new generation. Gee, wonder we've heard that theme before. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, uh, <laughs> the average uh, Japanese citizen is struggling with what is for them sky high inflation. Uh, now that must be sky high for Japan because at its peak it reached just over four percent. We hit eight point one. Uh, right now it currently sits at two point eight. We're similar right there. Uh, however, they're calling that our, sky high. <laughs> well, Japan has been in like in almost like zero percent growth for like for twenty straight years, though, right? That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, however, food inflation currently stands at about three point six, and electricity inflation is at thirteen point six. Uh, so mm -hmm. the cost of living is going up, and uh, in Japan, as opposed to other nations, uh, interest rates are rising. Now, they rose from zero percent to a quarter percent, and they're planning to rise again. Whereas, you know. <laughs> We're not nowhere near half a percent. Um, oh God, in no. Canada, however, uh, for interest rates, it seems that um, we were, we've been talking that interest rates might go down to uh, the, only to about like four by the end of this year. It seems that with the job numbers and uh, the pressure that's coming on in the United States for the Fed to cut by 50 basis points next time around in September rather than just 25, uh, wow. that uh, the Bank of Canada uh, might get down to 3.5% by the end of this year rather than 4 instead. So an accelerated schedule and might go down all the way to 2.75% rather than just 3 by the end of next year. And 2.75% seems to be the equilibrium point. Uh, yeah, the baseline. Like this, the baseline. So, hey, things might even be getting, there might be better news uh, come election time uh, next year here for Canada in order to push back on the right. 
Fingers mm. crossed. All push right. Back. Yes. The year of the pushback, 2024. Mr. Grizzly called it. All right. Get some cubs. That's the end of this episode of the Daily Beaver Morning Show. We hope that you love listening to us because we love making this for you, you, you. Remember, sharing is caring and word of mouth is priceless. So please tell your peeps and poops all about us. Yay. Um, if you would like to support us, you can. Because if you don't want to miss an episode, you don't have to. The Ray Girl, she helped you out by sponsoring our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north age weaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you go there, click subscribe. When we have something fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. If you would like to support us in other ways, well then, you need to make like Kit Elaine and surf on down to the True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated YouTube page. And there you will find our buttons. We want you to play with them. We want you to click them. We want you to lick them. We want you to flick them. Like, share, subscribe. They're all there waiting for you. So please help us out. It really, really, really makes us happy when you do. And if you would like to help us out in another way, then the QR code that has appeared by Mr. Grizzly's head will bring you to our coffee page. That's coffee, ko-fi.com, slash eager beaver, lowercase letters, all in one word. And there, you can leave a little donation to the help Mr. Beaver buy a new computer fund. Can we say that instead of hydration fund? Yes, it's, it's, it's replacement fund. Well, it's, it's, it's the operational fund, is what it is. We mm-hmm. got to pay for this stuff, man. And it ain't cheap. Absolutely, I'm cheap, but the show isn't. So. The show isn't. <laughs> I'm upwards of twenty thousand right now. Is what I've spent on equipment. I oh, mean, I love making that joke. I'm cheap and I'm easy. Yay. Okay. So, <laughs> I'm neither. Not, no, not really, kids. Not really. Uh, but uh, then you could do as Kit Wendy has. Keep up the good work, guys. Love you. Thanks for making my mornings. Sent us a little something yesterday. And uh, as did Kit Tabby G. Thank you for your show this morning, bringing uh, awareness to the treatment of vulnerable children in Ontario and the role the provincial government plays in this horrendous situation. Uh, thank you so much, Kit Chavi G, for that. That uh, that one's uh, particularly meaningful yeah. to me. So, thank that's you. That's very close that to one. home. That one hits close to home. And uh, two other of our kits. Uh, some other of our kits have uh, uh, lifted up their hand when I posted that uh, on Twitter and said, um, "Yeah, this uh, angers me because uh, I was a kid in care too." So um, it seems that um, I'm not the only one in our audience who has uh, passed through the, the system. No, you wouldn't be, sir. And I hope that everybody can raise their voices up and we can rise together to to put an end to this uh, horrible exploitation of the system of children and this incredible expenditure of money, which should not be taking place. Yep. 90000 uh, a month per child? Yep. yep. I've got a, a request in for the Ontario Association of Children's Aid Societies to hopefully get a guest uh, come on our show. Uh, to discuss that, that would be great hopefully i'm hopefully be will be able to speak to someone today because i would like to get as much data as possible before i appear on lower show uh yes tomorrow. of course uh, well you want to be informed most. yeah because i mean i have a little bit what i got in the news but i would really like to hear from people on the ground there mm-hmm. uh, but of course they're very very busy with this so you know then they're understaffed so i might not hear from them i, I basically gave them 48 hours notice which <laughs> might be a yeah, little tight yeah yeah like, Might be a little snug, uh, yeah. But, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get, and I'm going to try uh, anyway. Uh, but hopefully we will get somebody uh, on the show. So uh, thanks for all of you who have uh, supported us with your, your donations. It encourages us and lets us know that uh, you want us to do more, and uh, more we will have for you, we promise. Now, if you can't support us financially, that's perfectly fine because the gift of your attention is the one we cherish the most, and we would like to hear from you. Oh, Miss uh, Miss uh, Shadika, I was in foster care for six months. They didn't want to give me back to my mom. She had a CAS worker who fought for her and got me back. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm guessing if we're similar ages, uh, yeah, back in that time, uh, the philosophy of uh, trying to keep the kid in the home uh, if the kid was not in danger uh, was not the standard operating policy then. Yeah. 
Uh, indeed. So, uh, I forgot where I was. I think I just finished with the coffee. I think, yes. So, um, because democracy is something that you do. Um, if you happen to be in Ward 15 in Toronto, you have a by-election coming. Elmwood, Transcoda in Manitoba, La Salle, Villemar, Verdun in Quebec, also by-elections coming. And if you uh, live in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and New Brunswick, you have provincial elections coming up in September. So, um, you know, uh, make sure that uh, you find your candidate of choice. Make sure that you plan your vote. Uh, make sure that you uh, volunteer in any way that you can, either from a polling station or for your candidates. There's lots of door knocking, envelopes to be stuffed, phone banks, all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, uh, the, the the conservatives in BC are sort of unifying in order to try and defeat the NDP, which keeps on tripping over itself lately. It's like a really sure deal about uh, three or four months ago is no longer. Uh, but in Saskatchewan, it seems that the SAS party is tripping, so maybe there's an opportunity to get rid of them. And then your Brunswick Blanding absolutely has to go. So, um, yes. kids and cubs, you know what to do. And uh, tell all your friends, remember, friends don't let friends vote alone. Bring friends with you. All right. Mr. Grizzly, do you have some words of wisdom? Yeah. Uh, write to your MP in regards to the temporary, for, temporary foreign worker program and how it is exploiting people for profit. If you've been coming here for 21 years doing the same job and they classify that as temporary, the law needs to change because that's exploitation. You get no benefits. You get no health care. You get nothing. And they're paying you less than minimum wage in many, in many cases, not every case. In many cases, Mr. Jim said the median uh, income, a medium hourly wage for temporary foreign workers in Ontario is $28 an hour, which is okay. That's good. But it's, it's just the first time hearing of this. Yes, but that's because, all temporary foreign workers. That, those are like people that are brought in to work for IT companies as well. As, correct. It's not different. Correct. Just looking at the agricultural sector and the healthcare service sector and uh, fast food. And the and fast food. The it's yeah. Not the those are the people we need to fight for. Yeah, if you're if you're if you're working here uh, on a contract as an IT employee, you're getting paid a good wage, no question. But if you're here uh, picking crops, if you're working at uh, at Timmy's, if you're uh, working as a healthcare support worker, you're being exploited and underpaid, and they will dangle that carrot of, well, you should be happy to have a job. I'm like, no, you should be paid a living wage, and you should not be abused. You absolutely should not be abused. Jeez, not at all. Um, all right, and if you're in Ontario, please write to your MPP and tell them, like, what the F with regard to foster children? Yeah. Foster children. Out of all mm -hmm. the children out there, probably the ones that are the least able to advocate for themselves. All right? They're the ones that are forgotten a lot. They fall through the cracks. They do. Because everything is written for children living with their parents or living with a parent. And sometimes things are not written to include or they're not thought of. Because everybody goes, well, everybody, you know, children. It's like, yeah, but what about the other ones? All the ones that are not living at home. Right? So, uh, yes, please, 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 if you have uh, the ability, do write uh, your MPP if you're living in Ontario and demand better. Because right now, uh, Doug Ford, while claiming he's getting 10 to 15 calls a day on this, <clears throat> it seems that the only thing, if that's the situation, and all he did was request an R audit, that means that 10 to 15 calls a day isn't enough to really motivate him to get off his duff to do right by kids. So if 10 to 15 is not enough, maybe he needs 20 to 25 or 50 to 100. Yeah. to start to get it. All right. Sorry, not objective on this one. Uh, no. No, you I'm shouldn't be. On this one. All right, Mr. Grizzly, please cue the cock. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. 
The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors. The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, their uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster. Hot pepper sauce is made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Sorry. And uh, the Kits and Cubs uh, mentioned in uh, the chat that it is Minister Michael Parsa, who is the minister responsible for kids in care. So uh, right here on his website, if there's anything we can help you with, please contact us by email at michael.parsaco, P-A-R-S-A-C-O, at pc.ola.org, or by calling 905-773-6250. That's 905-773-6250. Call now. Operators will be standing by. And if you do, we will send you a lovely set of Ginsu knives. No, we won't. No, we won't. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> no, we actually won't. <laughs> but do your thing. All right. Love you. Gotta go. See ya. <laughs>